Hi guys, welcome back. I'm Dr. Matt Barton with you once again for Matt Chat episode 541. Uh, this episode features an interview with Mr. Jeff Green. He's a an industry veteran with over 26 years of experience, began his career in gaming journalism, 12 years at Computer Gaming World, aka CW, CGW, and Games for Windows, where he was known for his influential editorial work as well as his podcasts, GFW Radio. Then he uh, transitioned into developmental work, working in Electronic Arts and PopCap, and more recently as a consultant in game design and marketing. He was an associate producer on the Sims series. Anyway, he's a great guest. I think you're really going to love Jeff. He's got a lot of stuff to talk about and unique insights. So without further ado, here is Mr. Jeff Green. I've done that a hundred times. <laughs> I got like I'm paranoid about it. <laughs> yeah, I should be. I, you know, I I work for a Chinese company now, so I have to think about time zone all the time. Uh -huh. So I I should have been thinking about it this time. Hey, look at that background you got there. Yeah. Wow. Thinking about maybe this one or the Sims, and I'm like, this has a dragon on that it. That is a dragon. You know, I think that one sold well too because of the dragon. Interest, right? It's like. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, that's a magazine cover there. Yeah, that was uh, that was a fun part of every month was coming up with the cover. Oh, I bet. Yeah, did you have a stable artist that you work with, or was it? We did, yeah, and uh, you know, we always had pressure from above to try to do something, uh, you know, that was going to sell, of course. So there was always pushback every month, no matter what we would do. Um, and sometimes we would want to put things on the cover that they just had that they, I'm, I mean, the publishers were just not interested in. And so there was a constant push pull with, with, with the brass above. So what kind of stuff did they not want to see? I'm guessing kind of racy stuff or was it a, it wasn't that it was more, it was more about like the games themselves, like in the old days when there was, when there wasn't that kind of pressure, um johnny and the gang there would just put whatever game they thought was you know the coolest or the hottest at the time you know on the cover and so but later on when we were when ziff davis was heavily monitoring everything they didn't want to see things like flight sims on the cover or you know or turn-based uh uh turn-based strategy games or anything like that so you know we had to fight when we wanted to do something like that and Probably the most notorious example, at least internally, was when we uh, were, I went up to Bioware to interview uh, <clears throat> Greg and Ray about uh, Baldur's Gate 2. And at the time, you know, Baldur's Gate 1 was, was big, but it wasn't, Bioware wasn't quite what Bioware became yet. And so there was skepticism as to whether a Baldur's Gate 2 cover would actually sell. So they want, because it was the December issue, they decided, well, let's make it be like a holiday gift guide issue. And because we had covered all different genres in the gift guide, and one of them was NBA Live, which had Michael Jordan at the time, we put Michael Jordan on the cover. And uh, the Bioware guys were so upset. And I don't blame them. I mean, we were upset. It made no sense at all. Um yeah, and I think after that, it was harder to get a cover story with with, with Bioware. We kind of blew it there. Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah, I, I, it's kind of that, I wonder if it's to some extent a tell, tell wagging the dog type situation with that stuff sometimes, because if they, they might have this narrative inside about, well, this kind of game is not going to sell. So we're not going to put it on the cover. We're going to put this other thing on the cover. But don't they realize they're actually playing a role in that, not selling as well? I mean, not, not that it mattered in this case. But. Right. And and also, you know, the, 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 the demographic of our magazine at the time was such that, like, a Michael Jordan on the cover wasn't really necessarily going to sell, no. you know? I mean, we were, our audience was hardcore PC gamers, not sports fans. I mean, obviously, there's going to be overlap. But I'm sure there were a ton of a ton of our readers who were just like, what? Why would you do that? So anyway, that was the kind of thing that we had to put up with over the years. Um, I mean, sometimes they were right. And often they would, you know, just push us to have a more exciting cover. 
Um, but you know, it was a never ending battle. Once, once we were bought as tends to happen with many, many companies, you know, we were, we were answering to a higher master and, uh, it didn't always go our way. It sounds like you got lucky though, Jeff, and that the only thing they ever disagreed with you about was the cover art, right? I mean, that was, <laughs> yeah. Other uh, than that, they just let you do what you want. Other than that, I could do whatever I want. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I always wondered when you like this this one behind me here. I'm guess that was a painting, right? And then they yeah. Put, so who's got these paintings? Are they around somewhere? You know, that's a great question. I I don't know if somebody, I, you know, if I had to guess, I would say they've probably all been destroyed. Um, but that piece of art probably came from Bioware itself. So maybe somebody at Bioware has that image. I don't think that we created that one in house. Sometimes we just got key art from the developers um, that that they would supply. Off, often that was the case. Um, so that was, I don't remember in this particular case, but yeah, somewhere um, s s around the time that the magazine closed down in 2008, we lost a lot of stuff, including our entire giant library of PC games. And it went all the way back to, you know, 1980 or something like that. I mean, there were games that were that came in the original, like, plastic baggies that the developers would sell them in. What do you mean and, lost? <laughs> well, or destroyed or dismantled. Ah. Yeah, I know. It's, I know, I know. it's painful. Ah, this is worse than the burning of the Library of Alexandria. So. <laughs> Maybe comparable. Um, nice. Yeah. Huh? I hear stuff like that and just it just hurts me. <laughs> it does hurt. No hurt respect that, for the past. Sort of thing over and over again too. I mean, the same. I guess they're like, well, it's just games. Who cares? You know? Right. I mean, I'm sure to the people who got rid of it, that is was exactly how they felt. Um, you know, a bunch of video games. Who cares? Um, that was uh, again. That was Ziff Davis, our our corporate owners. I have I have nothing to gain or lose by being nice about them. They still exist. So they paid my salary for many, many years. So I should be grateful. And I am kind of. I feel like we need a little Darth Vader theme music or something. <laughs> say the name. <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, you know, I'm teaching this game studies class uh, this semester. And it's mostly like 18 year olds, 18 to yeah. 20 year olds. And I told him I was going to have you on and you are kind of going over your you know, bio and stuff. And I just out of curiosity, I was like, well, how many folks, how many of you guys have actually uh, subscribed or bought a game magazine? <laughs> yeah. And Anybody? nobody had not a single, I was like, what? I mean, I was just totally like, you gotta be kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they still yeah. Exist, right. I mean, you know, yeah, I, I hear you. I, a friend of mine uh, texted me the other day, who's a game developer and he, uh, his, he has a teenage son and he texted me because he said, um, I want to arrange a Zoom call with you because I want you to talk my son out of becoming a game journalist. That's what that's what he thinks he wants to do for now? his career now. <laughs> this, this was yesterday. Oh, geez. Yeah. And I said, well, that'll be an easy conversation to have because there basically is no career in that anymore. It's 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 pretty dead. Yeah. Um, which isn't to say, I mean, obviously IGN is still around, Edge mm. Magazine is still around. There's some there's some very good sources for gaming news, um, podcasts like yours. I mean, there there's definitely information out there, but as like a viable career path now, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. That's pretty pretty definitive coming from you, I tell you. It, it hurts to say, because, you know, if I could do, if I could have done whatever I wanted with my career, I never would have left it. I loved it. It was, it was the, my favorite job I ever had. Mm. I started in 96 and stayed until the magazine closed down in 2008. And um, actually, I, I jumped ship right before it closed down. <clears throat> I knew it was coming. Um, but um yeah, I feel like every job I've had since then has been sort of like a a postscript to that job, you know, mm. because it was really that's all I had wanted to do was be a writer when I was younger and uh and a magazine writer. 
Um, and uh, so it was really my dream job. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can distinctly remember sitting on the BART train going into San Francisco every day and, and being like, yay, I get to go to work. You know, it, it, it's a it's a really privileged position to be in, to have a job that you love like that. Yeah. Um, and none of my jobs since then, even while they've been good and mm -hmm. fine and paid the rent and and, you know, have had their moments of of excitement and interest nothing compared to what it was like to be part of the magazine at the time when <clears throat> when people were actually buying and reading magazines yeah i was thinking about that this morning how the magazines because when i heard them say that they hadn't read any magazines it got me thinking about my own experience with magazines and you know i can remember we would every week my family we kind of lived out in the country so we would go into the into the into town, you know, we call it and go to the mall. And then my dad and I would make a beeline to the Walden bookstore <laughs> and buy uh, the gaming magazines. We'd buy like mm -hmm. uh, amazing computing, Amiga World. We had mm -hmm. an Amiga computer, so we were buying that. But that for me was my only connection to that industry and to the community, gaming mm -hmm. community, because I, I didn't know none of my friends had computers, you know, nobody was nothing right i mean that was my sole <laughs> connection so we'd read those articles we'd talk about them you know we'd keep the old issues to go back to and uh i don't i guess this, was it the internet that was kind oh of yeah hell in the coffin is that what happened yeah definitely it was it you know it, it crept up on us we could all see it coming if you go look through those older series of cgw we we had issues about the internet and uh you know, for gaming itself, it was mostly an exciting and, and cool thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all the possibilities that that offered for multiplayer in particular. Um, but for those of us who were writing print magazines, it was truly a, a you know, a death knell. Um, I mean, it took a while for it to happen. And there was definitely a period where some gaming sites had launched like GameSpot and others but we were still kind of the center of the of the news game news universe. So they were they were still up and coming, but boy did that did that change. Um, the 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 it it changed inversely rather rather quickly, um, and it just makes sense, you know. I mean, the fact that people could get their information um, right away like the minute it happened, you know, especially once things like Twitter came out and people could live tweet events and get the gaming news the minute that the, the journalists were hearing it, it just made the magazines completely obsolete. I mean, we were, we were writing on way ahead of, of time, right? So we would be writing in like August for the October issue. Um, and before the internet, there was that luxury of time. We could attend E3 in June. The magazine would come out in August and everyone reading it would be hearing about what happened at E3 in August. And they didn't think that was weird, you know, because that's just the way things were um, at the time. But you know, obviously it, it was not sustainable once people could get their news instantaneously. Yeah, I think that's been to our detriment in a lot of ways. <clears throat> good writing takes time <laughs> first and foremost you know i think sometimes uh, that's why i'm so dubious these days when a new game comes out and you get that all that hype because you know they probably have had five minutes with that game yes. how could they possibly have these impressions already yes uh, right I, I, play, I play a game a month later i have a different reaction <laughs> exactly yeah that's no actually, time for the stuff to percolate at all. Exactly. I mean, you never know what what your feeling is going to be about, especially like a, a long game, like an Elder Scrolls game or something like that, you know, to write a review or write your impressions based on the first 10 hours is just ridiculous, right? That's not the game at all. Um, and that's especially true of something like an MMO. And uh, when we were writing reviews of MMOs, it was a real dilemma for us because you know the the hardcore players of these games knew that it was all about the end game and there was no way in the time span that we had to write the review that any any of us could get that far so we knew that our reviews were limited in that respect 
you know, I think that's something that the internet could do really well is come back and re-review and check out, you know, what's going on in, in the game now, three months later, six months, a year. Hmm. Yeah. So, so yes, the internet killed the magazines and, uh, you know, I don't read any magazines now myself. I've got, actually, I have a couple subscriptions on my iPad. I don't know if that counts or not. I remember there was a couple efforts to kickstart magazines. Yeah. Too. Like retro was one mm -hmm. pieces for that. That's fun, but yeah, it's almost like this kind of novelty item now. It's yeah. Strange to think of it that way. Oh, well, I mean, I understand the, 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 the person you were talking about before wanting to get into games. Mm -hmm. I always assume that's something I would have gotten into you know, reading these magazines, right? You, you read them and you're thinking, well, once I go to college and you know, maybe I could get this job, wouldn't that be the best job ever? You know, and then mm -hmm. you finally get to that point and they're like, oh, but uh, this doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. <laughs> what the? Yeah. Pulling the, the rug out from under a kid, you know? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, they have, there's other options now, of course. There's, I mean, there's, I was going to say you could be an influencer, but there's like a glut of those and good, good luck emerging from the pack but yeah. there's other ways to get your voice heard or or be part of be be part of that without be necessarily being a magazine writer but um you know the websites don't pay that well and there's always way too many and the reason they don't pay too well is cuz there's always somebody who's going to do that job you know because it it does feel like the best job ever when you're doing it you're getting paid to play games and write about them i mean even these kids in this this class and been talking about it if i'm like here's this article i wrote online <laughs> um, who cares right <laughs> here's this magazine with this, one of my articles in it you know oh wow I mean, yeah. there, there's, there's just something about print i'm sorry it's true i get it it's traditional old-fashioned whatever but it's just not the same i'm with you i mean i assume we're similar generation and uh you know, that's that's the feeling I had. And that's why when I was younger, the idea of, of you know, of appearing in a magazine was so exciting to me. And and when I got a column in CGW, um, that to me at the time felt like a career peak. And really, it, it, it kind of was, you know, um, to have a monthly column really felt like to me, like, you know, I made it in some small way, you know. For me, it was it was it was good enough. It was I felt like this is what I wanted to achieve in my career. So, yeah, yeah. By the time I was doing this, by the time I guess I was old enough to actually write something, <laughs> somebody else would want to read. It was it was kind of I guess when was that? It must have been like late nineties, early two thousands. Mm -hmm. So we had a website with a. I don't even know if we had PDFs back then. I don't know if you ever heard Probably of it. Armchair, Armchair Arcade was what we were calling it. And we I had like uh, some covers mm -hmm. on Slash Dot. I don't know if you remember that. I, that I do, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was my big deal. It was like, oh, we've been Slash Dotted. You know, <laughs> now I've made it. You know, none of, everybody's like, what's Slash Dot? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I mean, the, all of us were, I mean, the whole thing was like, we just want to get this thing popular enough so we can print it. Mm-hmm. I find a publisher for this, you know, that, that yeah, piece together. It was, it was always exciting when the issue would come back from the printer and we would, we would hold it in our hands. That was something very satisfying about producing this thing on, on a monthly basis and all, all of it, the whole, the whole process of it, you know, the page layouts and what article was going to go where and all that. It was a fun, it was a fun puzzle to, to solve every month. Um, the flow, how is it going to flow so readers would feel like they were getting an experience from the cover to the end? Um, were most of the writers freelancers or were these people on staff? Or? It was probably, well, I don't know what the percentages were, but I, I was going to say 50-50. But it, yeah, I mean, there, were, there was a staff of in-house writers and editors. All the editors had to write articles as well. And what uh, for most of the time that I was there, the editor jobs were divided by genre. So there was an action editor and an RPG editor, et cetera. And um, that, that editor would also 
write probably at least one, if not more, reviews in their genre uh, every month. And we cross-pollinated too, though, of course, because we all had, you know, interest in all sorts of games. And then the rest, we did have a stable of freelancers who we depended on every month. Um, <clears throat> the most, the one who went on to the greatest uh, fame was Jason Kapalka, the, uh, <clears throat> this one of the co-CEOs of PopCap. Um, he started off, I mean, start off, but he, before he, he uh, founded PopCap with his friends, he was a freelance game reviewer for CGW. And I actually remember when he came to, uh, there he is. Yeah. When he came to visit us at the office and he handed us a floppy disk with bejeweled on it and said, well, this is what I'm doing now. And, you know, it didn't actually like seem like, okay, if that's really what you want to do, but you know, you're, you could, you could have a good living here as a magazine writer, but clearly, <laughs> clearly he made the right choice. And just, Chuckling, so they wanted to call it sexy action cool, right? That, yeah, that's a different. I wouldn't necessarily think bejeweled <laughs> when you think sexy action cool. <laughs> oh, yeah, wow, okay, yeah. I don't, we might go back a little bit here because mm -hmm. I'm kind of curious how, how you got into this stuff. You know, before the job, I mean, you probably did you grow up playing uh, around with computers and well, you know, magazines and watching war games or yeah. I mean, I'm I'm old enough that I I predate video games completely. Um, so you know, my formative gaming years were were largely uh, pinball yeah. in terms of being out in 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 public. Um, you know, those were the games we played away from home. At home um, with my friends, we played a lot of like the Avalon Hill war games, board games, you know, Battle of the Bulge and those kind of things. And then Dungeons and Dragons, of course, um, which, you know, was was like, you know, the devil's game back at that time. Uh, it's kind of hard to believe now it's so mainstream, uh, but but younger viewers of, of the show you know, you can Google it and, and see that it was like a, this, you know, uh, this big parental scare that kids were playing this game that that was uh, devil worshiping or whatever. I don't know. Have you ever run into Michael Stackpole? I know him, but I don't. I never met him. Yeah, we had him on. <clears throat> yeah, maybe a couple episodes back, and he did a lot of work trying to dissuade or discourage that. I have a couple people on the head had to deal with that sort of head on. Because yeah, people are like you're dealing with, you're trying to satanize my kids, and they're like, "What the hell are you talking about?" Right, it it was ridiculous. I mean, anybody oh, who that. knew the game knew it was just complete nonsense. Well, that's um, tunnels, the steam tunnels kid, and the right, the right, religious the little tract, you know, the dungeons. I forget the name of it. You know, what I'm talking about the little religious tracks. Oh yeah, sure. Little rectangular thing. Oh yeah. Apparently, one of those. I don't know about it <laughs> so uh, i so I, I played those kind of games so you were a satanist as a kid i was a satanist as a kid <laughs> yep yep worship the devil um i do remember when the first video game started showing up at the arcade this was silver ball arcade in berkeley and uh the they brought in a space invaders machine and a missile command awesome. and then later uh dragon slayer that was a kind of a game changer but all those games and the reaction to those of us who were like, you know, the arcade rats who were just hanging out there all day when they first brought in Missile Command and, and those games was kind of hostile. We were like, we don't want this video crap in our pinball arcade. I mean, some people were all over it right away, but I was definitely part of the crowd that was kind of Luddite and didn't want these newfangled electronic things messing up our pinball arcade. But of course, like everybody else, I got totally sucked into those very games um, well, I had a similar reaction but from the other from the opposite extreme because I, I would i'd go into an arcade and i would feel like i can play these video games at home mm -hmm. i won't find the pinball game because you know that's <laughs> a unique thing you can't you know mm -hmm. I guess, I mean, that's obviously there's pinball video games but 
Right, right, totally. right. Well, yeah. Let's we'll kind of tie back into what we've been saying, like printing and digital. Exactly. <laughs> like pinball. I mean, it's, it's like a theme coming together. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, on the on the writing end of things, I uh, growing up, my my Bibles were were Mad Magazine and, and National Lampoon as soon as my parents let me read it. And uh, that was my dream was to like work on a, a humor magazine. But really any magazine would do. I mean, I, I was writing from a very early age and that's really all I ever wanted to do. And, um, you know, I got an English degree in, uh, at uh, Cal. And from there, I I wanted to be a journalist or work for a publisher. And in the Bay Area at that time, most of the publishing jobs were in tech. Um that was where you had to go. And I was not a techie. I did not have that kind of background at all. But um, I ended up at a computer book publishing company called Cybex. And uh, that's how I got introduced to tech and started learning a lot of stuff. Um, and uh, that is sort of what led eventually to me getting to it's, it's too long of a story. But the the that was the first step that led me to computer gaming world. Basically, the condensed version is I ended up at a magazine called Mac Week, which was a weekly um, Macintosh business magazine. And uh, but I was getting computer gaming world as a, as a reader. By that time, I was I was all in on on gaming, and I loved that magazine. And uh, Mac Week was owned by Ziff Davis. We were owned by the same company, and the computer game world guys were in the same building and I was so jealous. I was just like, how, I can't believe these guys get to do this for a living. And I have to write about modems. It doesn't uh -huh. seem fair. And uh, a job opening came up and there were internal listings. And I basically begged the editor in chief at the time, Johnny Wilson to take me on. And I took a pay cut and a title cut. I went from a senior editor to an associate editor because I was so excited to get to work on a gaming magazine. Oh, that's commitment. You know, I think the Mac week, as I recall back then, a lot of the Macs were about desktop publishing. Yes. A big part of it. So, I mean, I could see why that would be a big demand. Yes. That's, that, that's exactly right. So you probably learned some stuff that helped you out, helped you out later there. Yeah, I kind of did. I learned Quark <laughs> and things like that. Um, you know, you can tell how excited I am, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, yeah, sure. I did learn a lot and I met a lot of people and it led to the CGW job. So I, I really should be grateful for that experience. And it taught me a lot about the magazine world. Um, and the fact that it was a weekly magazine meant we had weekly deadlines. So I got used to writing under pressure. So <laughs> all of, all of that was good. And that must've been intense. <laughs> it was super intense. Yeah. Our, that magazine, though, I, I think I told you, we, we talked before this, <laughs> you know, I got a, such a, I got this big archive of the CGW and I, mm. it's just, uh, it's, it's almost difficult to use in the sense that when I'm, I might go in there looking for a particular review or something, but you just get sucked in. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Fine. Yeah. I was a reader for many years before I subscribe or before I wrote for them. Yeah. And uh Yeah. It was a great magazine in its day. Did you ever think it was is it Scorpia? Is that her name? Or mm -hmm. their name? That's her name. Uh, their name? Yeah. What the? I, I don't know what her pronoun. their pronouns are at this point. Scorpia was a uh, pretty legendary, uh, legendary RPG reviewer uh, and columnist. Nobody except Johnny knew her real name or had ever met her. Um, I was actually her editor for a couple of years because I was the RPG editor and she wrote the RPG column. And honestly, we butted heads quite a lot because, um, because why? <laughs> because she wasn't, I, I, I want to be fair to her because um, it wasn't about her being wrong and me being right. It was just that because I had come from a, a, a writer background and hers was more, the gaming side she wasn't like a natural writer i was always trying to edit her her prose and it really upset her and anyone who gets their work edited i'm sure you have you know you know how it feels when somebody changes your uh, words around 
Yeah, they always make it worse. You know? Right. <laughs> Yeah, we got an editing. We got an editing and publishing class here, and there's at least a whole unit just on like, how do you be diplomatic? You know, because you got to. This is a, it's a special relationship. You know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's not an easy job. You know, you have to massage the the writer's ego, yet you want to do right by the magazine and not have something illiterate being published or I'm not saying that about Scorpio. I'm just mean in general, you know, you wanted to, and often, you know, things would just be factually wrong. You know, we were checking for facts as well. So it, yeah, being an editor, it's kind of trickier than it may seem at, at first glance, you know, that the, the balancing act between doing the right thing and keeping the writer happy is, is not always easy. Yeah. Just the impression I got, of their of her personality from those columns and reviews, <laughs> I'm like, you know, definitely opinionated. I mean, that's why it makes it fun as a reader because you know, you know, this is somebody that's played this game and has a yeah. strong opinion on it. <laughs> she had strong opinions. She did. She was she was pretty cranky. Um, but she, I don't know, if, I don't know where she is today, what she's doing. She probably doesn't have fond memories of me, but I have fond memories of her. Um, I think yeah. I've reached them. Reached her by email one time. Hmm. I think we actually, yeah, I think we worked together on a little thing for oh, the wow. magazine. But of course, I'm, I'm thinking, let's go on YouTube and do a, you know, video. Oh no, <laughs> not interested <laughs> in that at all. <laughs> like, oh shoot, yeah, yeah. Just looking at some of these CGW. Yeah, this is the kind of style here. Already. Yeah, that sort of retro look yeah painted look yeah those were great that was like when i started reading was around well that was the very first issue that one yeah there's your games for windows so this is so i guess this yeah this uh they closed this one and opened up games for windows yeah the story there is that um six yeah ziff davis was gonna shut us down um uh that was what saved us so it was either we become games for windows and be affiliated with microsoft or we don't exist um nobody particularly wanted to be the games for windows magazine um you know <laughs> that that wasn't the greatest brand um but it you know between that and losing our jobs and losing the magazine that was that was you know that was the choice we had so we took it and we did the best we could to uh try to still be CGW uh, within the context of, of that. And the only thing that we really had to change was there was a little advertorial is the obnoxious word for it. I don't know Ad if you, yeah. Advertorial. Yeah. It's, it's as awful as it sounds. Basically it's just an ad. It's all it was. And Microsoft would supply it and it would just be like, you know, whatever, five to 10 pages of propaganda about Microsoft products. Sounds like one of those pharmaceuticals. Ask your doctor about advertorial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Then it, you know, I was reading a little bit about the relationship between Microsoft and the, the magazine and how they were comparing it to the PlayStation magazine. And mm -hmm. you know, I guess Nintendo Power, you know, it's it, it seemed like the impression I got was they were relatively hands off. They were, they were, they submitted that advertorial every month, but basically they let us do whatever we wanted. So, so that was good. Um, they just, they liked that they had a branded magazine, but they never told us what to write. They never made us give positive reviews to Microsoft games. You know, there was always a, a nice wall there between um, advertising and editorial. I mean, that goes for everything that we ever did. You know, whenever somebody, a reader would sort of accuse us of, of being on the take or we gave it a good review because these folks advertise, it was always just kind of ridiculous to those of us on the editorial side because it that just wasn't the case at all. Um, in fact, we pushed back really hard. It's not that they didn't try to influence us at times. I mean, there were definitely cases when somebody from the ad department at CGW would walk over to our side of the building and they would know that we would have a negative review of let's just pick a game out of the hat. Um, Tomb Raider. 
they would see that we had a, a review coming out that it was going to get one star. That's not the case, but I'm just saying. Right. And there might happen to be a Tomb Raider ad in that very issue. And they would see the, you know, that car crash coming and they would come over and say, do you have to give it one star? Could you please just re-review it? Does that person really like that, that kind of game? And, you know, we never, we never back down. I, I can't think of a single case where we said like, yeah, okay, uh, we'll redo it. You know, we stuck by the writer's opinions. It was, it was extremely important to us. I mean, otherwise, what good were we? Then, then the magazine might just as well all be ads. I guess you had that. What do they call that? That uh, ethics. 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 Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've heard all sorts of stories from you know other. I, I knew some. Believe it or not, I had some students that ran this cheating or cheat website where they had cheats. Huh. For, yeah. Had some kind of as a sideline, some reviews of games, and uh, it wasn't like a big operation, right? But mm -hmm. they were big enough to where they were getting wooed by the publishers. Mm -hmm. They'd come in and invite them on a cruise and, you know, a little vacation and wine and dine them. And like, well, here's the game. And, you know, you guys can write whatever kind of review you want. <laughs> we'll still invite you back. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, um, I mean, if that's happening to this, this little, you know, crew, I mean, imagine. Like, yeah. They, we got lots of temptations you know they they there was in the the golden era you know 96 to whatever 2002 three four there were so many boondoggles you know they would take editors to hawaii um i went on a helicopter ride a, across the bay for for one game um it was a it was a playstation helicopter game oh well, can't remember the name of it it's to some extent i guess um, so yeah, so we got wined and dined and, and, but there was also a strict policy from Ziff Davis about like what we could accept or not accept. Like we, we couldn't accept gifts really. Um, or maybe there was like a dollar amount on it or something like that of, of what we could accept. Um, but in the end, it never did influence, uh, the stuff we would write, uh, and they would get mad that it wouldn't. You know, the publishers would be mad that 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 didn't somehow buy them fit more favorable coverage. <sighs> so that was really that was their goal. You know, they yeah. they weren't doing it because they just liked us. You know, they were trying to buy buy positive coverage. Yeah, that's, I don't see how you could avoid that conclusion. I mean, wow. Well, right. I mean, it's one thing to say, here's the game code for you to play the game and, you know, give you a media pack or whatever, <laughs> press mm -hmm. pack. <laughs> but uh, we're the, uh, let's ride on the helicopter. <laughs> exactly. In Hawaii. Oh, okay. Yeah. Keep that gravy train going. Yeah, exactly. You know, and then all sorts of freebies, you know, the the t-shirts and hats and stuff like that. It, it was never ending. It was a constant barrage of of gifts and toys and things like that. And I'm guessing you went to lots of the E3s and oh yeah, conferences and stuff like. That. I've heard stories about some of that, some of those shenanigans at those things as well. Of you know, probably seen a big cultural shift over the years. You know, with that. That's exactly right. Side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. Um, E3 went from a you know, fairly small, uh, extremely nerdy, um, just kind of more low key events to, to the extravaganza it became toward, you know, at the end with all the major publishers there and, and publishers spending literally millions of dollars on those, on those booths. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I counted the E3s I went to. I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I it was a lot of them. It was always fun. Mm -hmm. um, it was fun to, to gather and see all our your old friends and meet people from the, the industry and get to see all the games. And the great thing about being in the press at that time was we always got to cut to the front of the line. Um, so that was, an, that was another perk. That's worth it just for that perk. Oh, yeah. It was it was great. Um, that was when we mattered. <laughs> I had a 
there's a question here I think is kind of interesting. So they were asking about, I guess, your time with CGW, but we could think about other offices too. But were you did, were there games that you played, like as a team, or as a, the crew would come in, just blow off some steam, play games, or was it more like, this is our off time, we're not touching games? <laughs> oh, my God. No, we were terrible. We played games all the time. <laughs> oh. That would be the case. Yeah, we we wasted hours, especially when uh, when the um, multiplayer shooters started coming out, like Quake. Um, there were times when we would roll into the office, put our stuff in our cubicles, go to the lab where where the uh, tech guys had set up the LAN, and it was basically just like we went we're at an arcade all day. We would just be sitting in there playing Quake all day long until the editor-in-chief or managing editor would come in and yell at us. But the, the greatest victory would be when one of those two guys would come and sit down and play with us. But then, <laughs> then we knew we were, we, were, we were good for the day. And you went from a weekly to an annual publication? <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's the thing about, you know, the difference between when I, you know, going from Mac Week to CGW was being on a weekly, there was really no time to screw off like that. You know, we our deadline would be on Wednesday, and if you screwed off on Thursday and Friday, you know, to blow off steam because you made your deadline, well, then all of a sudden it's Monday again and you have two days until your deadline. So there was really no wiggle room. But with a monthly, once we turned in the copy, you know, there was easily uh, at least one week, if not two, where we could just go, eh, we'll get to it. Let's let's play, let's play, you know, Civnet. Um, I don't know if you remember that. There was a that was the first attempt at a uh, multiplayer civilization oh, uh, uh, or, or whatever multiplayer game we were playing at the time. Um, certainly the, the, um, the, uh, yeah, there you go. Oh, simultaneous turns. Yeah. It didn't really work. You know, I mean, and I mean, it worked, but it, Civ is not really the kind of multiplayer game that, that is, uh, you know, was, wasn't really that visceral. Wasn't that exciting for those of us. Shooting each other all day in Quake was was a lot more fun. Put it that way. Oh, I, <laughs> I love I love some Civ though. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm just kind of back in the world of Civ. Okay, uh, the computers that you had at your disposal. I mean, I assume you had like the best gaming rigs and the well best, you know, configurations for all the games you were playing. Or did you did you intentionally like set up on a mid-range machine just to so you could review it for that? You know? Well, both really. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. We would um we would have rigs that would have like the minimum spec just so we could see if if that was actually true or not, because as we all know, they often exaggerated that. And uh, the game wasn't real. It was like nominally playable, I guess, but, you know, not really. Um, but we didn't have like the highest end machines either, because, again, we were dealing with, you know, our corporate masters and they didn't necessarily, you know, you know, what, you're playing games at work? You know, that kind of thing. We'd like it's our job, you know. <laughs> so we often had to fight to get new equipment. That was where the uh, the console magazines had it a lot easier than us because it was just you know the PlayStation or the SNES or whatever. There was no there was no sound cards and graphics cards and all the things that that we had to deal with at, at the. What a mess! I mean, yeah, I can remember Sound Blaster, Ad Lib, and this and this, and then then that's just the sound, you know. And then <laughs> right, the thing with the mess with the auto exec bat and the config.sys files was a whole thing jeez 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 so how'd you get into podcasting then was that really yeah you got in was that like a side thing or did you it did was a about? yeah it was a side thing it was really kind of foisted on us actually um it was pretty early days of of uh podcasting not everybody even knew what that word was at the time that we started doing it um, but uh, Amanda, this is this is when we were feeling the you know the pressure of the internet, and um, 
there was this, lots of discussion about how do we stay current? How do we stay relevant when there's stuff coming up every day and we're a monthly? You know, we need to be more visible during the month. Um, and so our our uh, bosses from above basically mandated that each magazine have its own podcast. And honestly, we didn't want to do it because uh, that wasn't our vocation. You know, none of us had background in in that kind of thing. Um, we were largely writers. A lot of us were shy or, you know, introverted, didn't want to speak, you know, on camera or on audio. And, um, and also we were resentful that we had to do more work and there wasn't any extra compensation for it. I'm like, oh, we're going to do this too on top of making the magazine. So what do we get for it? Well, nothing. So of course, I just spent all this time talking about how we played Quake all day. So maybe nobody feels <laughs> feel very sure. sorry for me. Sure. <laughs> um, Are they making money with the podcasts, or was this just no. a loss leader type of deal? It was a loss leader type of deal. Um, but what what happened was we started to really enjoy doing it. You know, in spite of ourselves, it be, it became something that we came to love quite a bit. And you know, it was sort of ironic that over time the podcast, I wouldn't say it eclipsed the magazine, but a lot more people were were listening to the podcast than were reading the magazine, that's for sure, mm -hmm. by the end. Yeah, I mean, that's how I ended up doing this. <laughs> right. <laughs> when I was right. writing articles and like 100 people read it, you, right. put, you put up a podcast, uh, maybe 200 people, you do a YouTube video, and now you got like a 1,000 people. Right, right. It was, a, it, was, it, it was and is a great way to to reach an audience, um, certainly compared to, to print media. Um, yeah, so we um, we really got into it and uh, did it up until the end. And then once the magazine was over and uh, I was out of there, you know, it, it wasn't immediate, but shortly after that, I started doing the live streaming of, of playing games um, just to kind of keep my feet in the in the you know in the arena of just speaking and write and talking about games in public, um, so I did that for a number of years, um, and that was that was a blast. I really liked doing that a lot. Um, I was one of the older one of the older video game streamers at the time, and I guess I still would be if I if I was doing it now. Um, but that was kind of kind of my brand. I was like the old guy playing games. That's Not good, very well. It's <laughs> a good brand. Yeah, I had a question. I feel like we kind of already touched on this, though, about what was lost. I mean, there's lots of this gain, sure. Well, I, I think what was really lost was um, kind of the more deeper introspective um, analysis you know, a lot of the writers would spend a long time um, really thinking about uh, the stuff they were writing about, whether it was a review or or whatever it was, or a longer think piece. And, um, you know, it wasn't just like off the top of the head, uh, you know, quips or whatever, you know, people do now, um, you know, sound bites, um, which isn't to say that you know, I don't want to be reductive here. There's plenty of excellent commentary about gaming online, but but what there isn't are long form articles about gaming. You can find it, but it's not. You can't go to the supermarket and get it. You know, you, there's probably niche publications that that publish this kind of thing, but um, I do think, yeah, these more long form pieces is something that that got lost in the shuffle. Um, but you know, I wouldn't want to go back to those days because the 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 advantage, the good the good stuff that comes from the instant access to information, um, I think more than makes up for it. Also, there's a lot more opportunity for a lot more people to to be in the conversation and mm -hmm. have their own podcast. And you know, it's not just like ten editorships at each 
you know, at the six magazines that exist. I mean, those positions were really rare. Nobody ever quit because it was such a good job. So it was very hard to break in. Now, you know, anybody with a microphone and, and some talent can can do it. That's such a good point. Yeah, I remember how excited my dad was. He got one of his letters printed in a magazine. <laughs> And that was just made his, you know, <laughs> so happy about this. Like nowadays, that would just be so easy to do, right? You just leave a comment somewhere, or <laughs> right? Just talk directly to other other fans. So. Yeah, yeah. Getting a letter uh, in the magazine was kind of like a big deal, right? You know, oh right? my god! Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know how many letters did you get typically. We got we got a lot of letters, um, and of course they were letter letters you know they came in the in the mail and uh often they were you know nasty um name calling you know people mad because we reviewed things that they liked or things uh, and then uh, others were just about can i work there what do i have to do to get a job there mm -hmm. um yeah um there was it was a good dialogue but again you know that was that's another thing that as you said, you know, the, the internet kind of improved, you know, you can leave a, leave a message or leave your comment on anybody's post at any time, you know, and, and see your name there. Um, there's a lot, lot more access to the, to the people you're writing to. It's so funny to think about the trolls back then. You know, they had to take the time to like write a letter, put, it not put the stamp out of the post office. <laughs> it must have been like, oh, it's another one. Uh, <laughs> oh Lord. Your your turn. <laughs> yeah, you like write back to him. You just throw it in the garbage. Um, we wouldn't throw it in the garbage. We would, we would. I mean, the letters that we liked, uh, and that often included, you know, ones that criticize us, not just kissed our butt. We would, you know, we would type them up and put them in the magazine, and we would respond to them in the magazine. We never responded like personally offline. We did oh, that. Sure. That we didn't do. Oh, yeah. Um. Yeah. Oh. I remember for. I don't know how many months it went on, but um, we uh, we made some crack about <laughs> about Canadians actually in one of the issues. It was just completely random. It meant nothing. It was just a joke. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, we didn't want to piss off the buyer guys, but um, we we said something, and then we printed a letter from a Canadian who wrote in and was was offended, and in our response. We we offended him again. Uh, we we made another joke on purpose about Canadians. Then we got more Canadians writing in, and it got to where we had a section in the letters page that was just called Canadian Corner. And every <laughs> month we would we would we were just sort of poking the bear on purpose just to rile up the Canadians. Um, we were just amusing ourselves. There was no <laughs> other purpose. Ah, Canada. So how'd you move from the, all this writing and podcasting into uh PA popcap and all the rest of it? Yeah, that was um that was really a matter of the magazine closing, and I had a certain amount of experience and I needed a job. And um, like I just said a couple minutes ago, it was hard to get another job in video game journalism because nobody ever quit. So when CGW shut down and I was now out of a job, um, well, I mentioned before I quit ahead of time. So I quit and there wasn't like, you know, a number of game journalist positions that I could choose from. Uh, there were in fact none. So what was I going to do with my career? Well, like people in any industry, you you know, you work with your connections. So who did I know? I knew people in the game industry because I had interviewed them and talked to them and, and befriended them. It wasn't that I had always had aspirations to be a video game designer or a producer or writer. I didn't. I was strictly a magazine guy, but now I was in the position of needing work. So I hit up different people. And one of the people who responded was, at the time, was Rod Humble, who at the time was the uh, head of uh, The Sims at Electronic Arts. And uh, I had interviewed him a number of times and I wrote to him and I just said, hey, I'm looking for a job. Is there any chance that, that uh, there he is or his avatar? 
Yeah, I guess that's. I mean, he looks just like this. He looks just like that. Yeah. Um, great guy. Really, really smart guy. Um, anyway, he he hired me to uh, to be a producer on The Sims, um, and that's how that part of my career started. And um, boy, was it a was it a shock to the system to go from writing to making games. It was, it was, it really kicked my butt. Um, also, I went from being the editor in chief of this magazine that was fairly high profile, and you know, I had a sort of a big head because of that, to being you know, a low man on the totem pole where no one gave a, a toss about what I had done before. Not at all. In fact, if anything, my game journalist career was a negative. Oh, um, negative. Oh, like, yeah. Like, oh, you wrote, you wrote a negative review about my game. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> when I was introduced to the Sims team and people met me, there was a lot of like, really, this guy? Or um, or like, oh, a, a game reviewer. Great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So I had to, you know, eat a lot of humble pie when I joined the team. And that also um, applied to what I got to do on the Sims team, because as I quickly learned, there was a hierarchy within the Sims organization of who got to work on what Sims game. So at the time, I think it was, I might've been Sims three or four. I can't remember which was the big Sims game in production at the time. But there was no way I was going to get to work on that one, which is, of course, what I wanted to work on. But I learned quickly that, you know, there was I had to get in line to work on that one. And so I had to work on like the more minor Sims properties, like the kids games, like Sim Animals and uh, My Sims Agents. Those were those were the two Sims games that, that I got to work on. And um, I don't regret that job at all um because there you go i uh, yeah i wrote some of the um some of the incidental dialogue so if you you know clicked on the characters you know there would be random dialogue that would happen every time you clicked on it so i got to write uh different lines what i did one day was i i used a bunch of quotes from the movie taxi driver and i had them you know you talking to me that kind of thing and they all got cut but i i, I amused myself uh by doing that um, you know, this game was, it was fun to work on. I mean, nobody cared about it. I don't know if it sold any copies except maybe to my family. Um, but, um, positive received positive reviews. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the Wii version or the DS version? I worked on not the DS version, the Wii version. Yeah. Yeah. You're yeah. <laughs> good oh job. good the weavers oh good okay um but you know the the big picture is that i learned a lot i learned a lot about how a game is made and um just how difficult it was and all the decisions and the compromises and uh the, the minute uh you know day-to-day -day things that would affect the game's development um it was such an eye-opener to me um, I think the biggest thing that I learned was that when we were at the magazine or even when I was just a fan and a reader, you know, you're playing a game and you're like, why didn't they, why didn't they think of doing this thing? Why didn't they put the, the clock in the top right or whatever, whatever the thing was, or why did they have an arrow here telling you where to go? What I learned was that they did think of those things. Like every, it's very, very intelligent people who are working on these games. It's just that for whatever reason, that feature couldn't be in because of some other feature, maybe, or because they didn't have the budget or they didn't get the approval or they couldn't figure out the tech. But it's not like we were smarter than the developers. We weren't. They they thought the they knew what the problems were and did their best to fix them and to improve things, but often you ran out of time or there just wasn't the resources or there was just a conflict or, or whatever. So, you know, that, that was a real educational experience just to learn how, how collaborative the process is and then just how difficult it really is 
to uh, put it all together, especially when you're talking about a big budget game with, you know, 50 people working on it or a hundred people or whatever, however many, um, you know, the experience might be different in a smaller place, like super giant where that has, you know, a handful of employees. Well, maybe now they have a lot, but, you know, a small independent company. That's what I mean. Yeah, it's too bad we can't experiment and send you, if we could go back in time, I wonder, you know, if you'd have had this experience working on the games first, before you went into writing about them, you think that would have changed everything? Well, that was the number one question that they always asked me at, at, at EA was like, well, now that you know, do you feel bad about what you wrote? <laughs> and I um bad about it, but I mean, you would have had insights. Yeah, I had insights. I mean, the only thing that I felt bad about is when we, when we really went after bad games, you know, it's, it's always fun to write a bad review, right? It's more fun than writing a good review because um, you get to be more clever. Um, it's, it's just the truth. And so sometimes we took pot shots that were not necessary and that really actually hurt people's feelings in real life. You know, I, I, I learned that thing too, that, you know, these were, real people who are coming in every day and working hard and doing their best to make sure that this thing would was good because they had pride in their own jobs. And then some idiot from a magazine, you know, in three paragraphs completely decimates you, you know, it, 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 you know, I would have maybe had a gentler touch if I knew. Um, but one thing that I wouldn't have done is I wouldn't have changed scores or changed how I ultimately felt about a game. Like if the game was is bad, it's bad. And, and the readers deserve to know that, right? Because we were writing, we weren't writing for the publishers or the developers. We were writing for gamers. And we were trying to inform them on uh, how they should spend their money. So I, you know, I definitely don't have regrets about calling a bad game bad. Um, maybe just the tone. If I could go back in time, I would change a little bit. Yeah, I've often heard, you know, I've had lots of designers and developers on the show, and you know, they'll, they'll talk about how basically just everything was falling apart, you know, and they they realized the game wasn't any good. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think they get it, but yeah, I think that's got to be one of the hardest things is reading a stinging, scathing review of something you worked so hard on. And, right. And they tell you, don't take it personally, but, you know, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, when people criticize articles that I wrote, I was like, you know, I'd be wrecked for days, you know, so imagine a game where people work on it for years, um, you know, blood, sweat and tears for years, and then to, to be dismissed, um, you know, by by some sarcastic writer. Um, yeah, it, it, it would hurt. Yeah, that's a good point, too, that it's easier to write a bad review. Mm -hmm. You know, I've often thought this and I've thought about it. Like, why is that? And the only thing I can come up with is, you know, if you like, it's harder to describe what you like about something. <laughs> right. It you know, kind of is. This is fun. This is great. You know, I had to, woo, it was, you know. Uh, yeah. How do you like, you know, get beyond that? To <laughs> try yeah. To, it's difficult to like explain why this is fun. Easy right. to say why it sucks. Way easier to say why something sucks. Um, yeah. Um, the hardest thing for me to write actually wasn't positive reviews. It was previews. For me, that was really difficult because you don't know what the game is actually going to be like when it comes out. We would write these things way ahead of time. So all we had to go on was what we were being told and what we were being shown. And you know, you don't want to uh, presume anything. So, you know, you have to sort of take it at face value, um, what they're saying. But then you feel like you're writing marketing copy if you just write what they're telling you. Mm -hmm. um, but if you analyze, if you start analyzing it or, or reviewing it in your preview, you're being unfair too, because it's not done yet. So it was really a dilemma for me in how to um, sound authentic, like I was, I was previewing the game as an individual with a brain, and not just uh, regurgitating what I was being told. It was really a difficult thing to do. I, I actually really hated writing them. Well, that happened a lot. I assume it did. 
happened a lot. And of course, the cover stories were almost always previews, um, like the Baldur's Gate 2 story that I wrote. But the good thing about articles like that would be that they would be heavily interview based. Um, you know, I could write about the studio. I could write about um, the individuals working on the game, what their day to day was like, that kind of thing. Um, but writing a regular old, you know, one or two page preview, I found very difficult. And if I could find your review of Baldur's Gate 2. <laughs> You could probably find it. Do you remember? Oh, oh yeah. Oh God, I would have no idea. There is an archive online of every magazine. Um, there's a CGW museum where somebody actually scanned in every single issue um, that existed. Um, I'm sure you could. I don't know if this is the right one. It's just that... a pop that up. I don't see anything about Baldur's Gate on there. No, the... I don't see anything about Baldur's Gate there. Yeah. No, we could find it. I'm just curious if you liked it or not. Oh, I'm sure I did. I remember. I actually don't remember reviewing it. I remember re reviewing Fallout One. That was a blast. Fallout One. Oh, yeah. yeah I love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, Tim Kaine's got a great uh, YouTube channel too. Yeah. Yeah. If you ever watch. watch yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great guy. Real. Really. Really smart. Those were. Those were golden years back when those games are coming out. That was that was probably the highlight of my time at CGW was around around those years. And I was really fun as the RPG editor that that the the genre kind of uh uh revived itself around that time, you know, with with the Black Isle games and Fallout and and uh well of course the Ultimas were still coming out and the Wizardries, but there was definitely a a a, a steep decline for a few years there oh yeah well i don't know if you ever saw that dungeons and dust tops books that i've done yes but the first edition of that was it was so weird because at the end i'm basically like that and this was the end of the genre right this is the end of an era right it was like a tribute to a thing to a defunct thing right that's like shortly after the book <laughs> like exploded again you know no yeah like, Oh, I could probably added like two more chapters to it. <laughs> like, thank God. But I'm right. like, for like the longest time. Oh, uh, turn based is dead. Right. This is dead. This is dead. I'm really... and then yeah, it, it, it seems to go in cycles, right? Well, you just you need a good, a uh, really good game in that genre to come out and it revives the whole thing. Right, and Fallout did that, uh, Diablo did that, and of course there were lots of arguments about was it Diablo really an RPG or not, but but the bottom line was, you know, it, it had a lot of the tropes of an RPG, um, and it and it sort of mainstreamed the genre. I think it helped, it helped people who had never played an RPG before see what they could be like. Oh, yeah. I know a lot of people that got into that that probably hadn't played anything in the genre before. Right. And they go on from that to explore some other stuff. And right, exactly. I think it was a good gateway. A gateway. <laughs> <laughs> gateway drug. Speaking yeah. of Satanism, I were all the way back to like the <laughs> all this <the, laughs> stuff in that. That's why it's so awesome. Well, can we just go back to the Sims for a minute? Sure. I had a question about that. And you said you came into it, I guess, after it was it had been going on for a while. Mm-hmm. But I guess you did when I guess Sims 3 is I'm just trying to think of when it was like at its biggest peak, or maybe it's just continued on ever since. But yeah, I mean was there a was, sense like this is gonna this is the big cultural phenomenon? Was it at that point when you were there? Yeah, for sure. Like joining that team was like a big deal. Um the Sims was riding high at the time. Actually, oddly, coincidentally, I swear I didn't do this on purpose. The coffee mug that I grabbed for this. <laughs> this was my uh I think my name is on there. Yeah, Hello. that was that was the I day one mug with a name on yeah, it. Yeah, that was the day one gift. Um don't drop it. <laughs> no, no, I, I covet it. Um yeah, it was it was Sims was a big deal. It had its own floor at, at the EA headquarters in Redwood City, you know. Um, the, the team that was making the flagship game was, you know, they were very important people to, to EA. So it was, uh, sorry about the dog barking there. 
I didn't even hear it. <laughs> oh, okay, got it. Um, uh, well, I can hear it, so hold on a second. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to close the door. Okay. She's barking really loudly. Yeah, it was it was really a huge thing, and I felt honored to be to be part of it. Um, even though I was working on games like My Sims Agents, it still was an exciting time to be there. And uh, yeah, and there were people who you know whose entire career was was, and I don't mean this in a bad way. I think it was kind of cool, who, but whose whose entire career was like writing the copy for like the furniture in The Sims, you know things like that that were that were very there were jobs that went you know really drilled down into very specific things um and everybody everybody loved their job it was a very like happy happy place to be a couple so. of things i've heard about the sims i might bounce off of you mm -hmm. see what you think about it yeah uh, so there's there's some spec. A lot of people ask, what was it about the game that made it so popular? Was it like this the doll dollhouse or the was it this corp uh, capitalism conspicuous cons some kind of weird thing with that? <laughs> I'm just kind of curious why, why you think it was successful. And then related to that, I, I've often heard it was one of the most successful games with women. Yeah, a lot of women uh, love this. So yes. just love to hear your thoughts on on those. Yeah, well, I'll take the uh, I'll take the second one first. Um, yes, it was extremely popular with women, and actually, interesting, there were there were a lot of women who worked on the game as well. Um, and I don't really know why that is. I mean, you know, you could you could say things that would sound, you know, kind of stereotypical and maybe not true, but you know, the fact that it wasn't violent, you know, might have appealed to women more. You know, again, I don't want to. I don't want to risk saying. You know, I know what you mean. <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, but I think there is some truth to some of that, right? It was. A, it was a more inclusive game. Also, it was a game that, like, a family could play together. Um, it. Uh, my daughter, uh, I introduced her to The Sims very early, and she actually, like, at age twelve or so, was writing reviews of, of the Sims like add-ons in, in the magazine. There was a little bit of nepotism going on there. Um, yeah. um, but, you know, so it was a game that anybody could play. It was G-rated, basically, though, of course, they had a few adult themes in there, but it was all very clever, cleverly kind of couched, like woo-woo for sex, that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, so I, I do think that it, it had a strong... Uh, and still does have a strong female audience, which is which is only good, you know. Um, and then hmm, your other question was, sorry, remind me. Um, oh, you know, it was such a huge game, and it's an interesting game. I mean, it's very different than a lot of the other, mm -hmm. like Sim City. I mean, some people compare it to that, but it's just, uh, you know, I have to admit, if I just heard about the concept and I'd never. I didn't know anything about its history. Somebody just described uh, what the game was. I don't know if I would have just jumped to the conclusion. Yeah, this is going to be a <laughs> this is a right. big, huge thing, you know. I don't think that Maxis knew at uh, the time. I'm pretty sure that everybody there thought it was, you know, a big risk. Um, you know, Sim City was really the the flagship title of Maxis at that point. They had other sim games sim copter sim hotel or sim tower not hotel yeah, i love sim tower um but the sims itself was yeah it was a big leap of faith and maybe people just um like liked the dollhouse aspect as you mentioned you know just sort of liked the control of managing somebody else's life being the puppet master and of course you know there's a million stories about people torturing their sims and putting them in swimming pools and taking out the steps. So they they're trapped in there forever. Um, you know, there were a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people who just like to torture their sins. So there was, there's that aspect of it as, as well. Um, yeah. Somebody ought to write a book. You should write a book. I thought it was sense. just me that did that. So yeah, we're all terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we're not in the simulation ourselves. You know, that's what that 
game does. Every time I play it, like, don't you get that weird sort of philosophical thing going? Like, what if this is me? And there's a <laughs> absolutely, and you've got a, a green that. triangle above your head with your mood. Uh oh, <laughs> yeah, that's that's fun. Yeah, I was... we... yeah. Go ahead. Another thing about The Sims, real quick. Mm -hmm. Sims online. Mm. Wasn't there an effort to like make an MMO out of this that kind of fell apart? Do you know why that? Yes. Worked? Um. Yes, that was a really interesting story. Um, we we did a cover on The Sims Online, and when we went to the studio to check it out, um, we were actually really impressed by it. Um, you know, it seemed like there was a lot of um, a lot of great creative energy by the people who were playing it, but that's because the people who were playing it were the designers at Maxis. You know. <laughs> So they were very creative and they had great ideas. But the, what happened when the game actually came out is that, it, well, it turns out people just like want their content. They didn't want to create, you know, they wanted just to be entertained. It was, I mean, it's so interesting now because there's so many games that are all about players creating. It's become such a huge thing. Roblox and Minecraft, of course, is, are the two huge ones in Fortnite. Um, there's, a whole generation of kids who that's like, that is what gaming is to them is something is creating. Um, so that's really cool. At the time of Sims online, it just didn't really compute. It didn't translate into something that anybody wanted to do. Um, Too ahead of its time, I guess. It was ahead of its time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wonder how it would do if it, if it came out now. That's a, Maybe they should try it again. <laughs> they like really the should. That's they should. Game. They might be, for all I know. They, I mean, it would be weird to think that they would be working on a Sims game now that wasn't uh, an online. This is another one. You know, if I would have had a hard time predicting the success of The Sims, I would have thought, given its success, surely The Sims Online would you know, just seem like a natural. <laughs> oh, totally. I mean, uh, we. that's why we put it on the cover. We were really excited. We thought it was a great idea. And just the execution just kind of fell flat or or it just didn't it just didn't capture the audience the same way. People, it turned out that people just wanted to have their own sim, their own sims and not visit yeah. other people's sims. I could see that, especially if you're torturing your sims. Maybe you kind of want to do that <laughs> for privacy. <laughs> yeah, right. and, hey, this has been fantastic. I'm so glad we... Connected. Oh, I, it's wonderful to talk to you. I, I've watched past episodes of the show, and and I'm I'm really flattered that you actually asked me. So oh. so thank you. Flattered you came you. on. What's what have you been? Uh, you got any projects coming up? Anything you're working on now? Or you got your guitar back there. You might be. Uh, yeah, I, I I'm in my like sort of offline semi-retired phase. I'm I'm trying to pick up the that's a bass. I'm trying to that's pick up the bass, bass again, and. Uh, yeah, I actually wasn't playing games for a while, but now I'm a hundred. I'm totally addicted to Monster Train. I don't know if you've played that game, but it's like a Slay the Spire kind of uh, rogue, roguelike. What's it called? Deck builder. It's called Monster Train. Monster. Uh, it's an incredibly addictive strategy game. It, it it was on Steam first, maybe, and now I think it's on every platform. And it just came out on iOS recently. Um, yeah, that's it. See that overwhelmingly positive reviews. Um, excellent strategy game. Um, Roguelike deck building game. Yeah, I'm all about the deck builders. Is that on a train to hell? Yes, you actually, that is the yeah, theme. This, this keeps coming up with you. <laughs> yeah, what is that? <laughs> I need to think about that. Not, I don't know a whole lot about this, this uh, card genre. It's a lot of fun. I mean, the card metaphor, it, it doesn't even need to be cards, really. Um, it's just about unit placement and, uh, yeah, strategic unit placement is really what it boils down to. Uh, there's just an endless wave of enemies that, of course, get more and more difficult. You have a set number of cards. Uh, there's different races. The different cards do different things. There's always trade-offs. There's always, you know, if you take this thing, you're going to get this amazing offensive advantage but now you're going to be defensively weak. It's 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 very, very deep and a lot of fun. Rock, paper, scissors type. I'm getting no uh I'm getting no uh kickback for 
plugging this game. It has nothing to do with my job whatsoever. What if there's a nice parallel, though, just to kind of tie things up? Because I guess the, the cards w- would have been physical printed cards at some point. Like in the day. Things, and now they're now the cards are back, but they're in a game. They're digital. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, then we can ask you one last thing. Sure. So I got some gaming magazines. Like I kind of want to keep them in good shape. Do you have what works for that? Just the same stuff for comics, or is there like a um better way to archive them? That's what I would do if it were me and I was archiving them. I would put like I would do it just like comics. Yeah, I would put a backboard and put them in a a cellophane, not cellophane. You know what I mean? Like a plastic plastic sheet. That's how the same thing I do with all my records. I see everybody does that with comics, but for some reason they'll just have the stack of magazines, you know. Yeah. At CGW, at the magazine itself, we bound them into big, big books, which also got lost when everything was ah. yeah. <laughs> That's too bad. It'd be great to be able to buy that. For sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, Jeff. <laughs> thanks so much, Matt. I really appreciate it. Oh, appreciate it. Sorry about the time zone. Confusion. No, no, I apologize. That was my mistake. Yeah. Good. Now keep in touch. I'll let you know when we. Yeah, play. yeah. I I accepted your LinkedIn, so let's uh, let's keep in oh, touch. Oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you. Okay. Take care. Bye. And... That's all for this week's episode. I think my horn is possessed. Uh, Hope you guys enjoyed that. You know, we've been trying to crank out more episodes. I hope you've uh, appreciated that. I'd really like to get back to that Matt Chat weekly thing. And we've been in the past three weeks. So keep your fingers crossed we're able to keep that going. Uh, If you like the content, if you like the shows, then you need to help out. Please, 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 double please, double sided please, please, and wow, please. Go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon page. It only takes a couple of minutes. Set up an account. You can do a one-time donation. Set up a subscription. Set up a pledge tier. uh, Get some cool stuff. we got an awesome Discord channel that's, in my opinion, one of the best uh, out there. If you like the content of the channel, you'll really like the community we've put together uh, around it. And I want you to be part of that community. It's a good group. Uh, So just go to the link. Click. Don't think about it. (laughs) <laughs> sign up become a ratron you're gonna like the show and we're gonna like you and everything's just gonna be wonderful yeah it's just gonna be a, a really good decision <laughs> click on that you know i've been uh we're about 90 percent of where i want to be with the funding on this show just you know it's like teasing me it's just tantalizing just that little last little sliver of support that we need so uh, again uh, if you haven't supported the show, please do. If you're maybe at the buck level, two bucks, you know, whatever, if you can increase that a little bit, just help us get to that uh, to that edge, that threshold, you'll have my eternal gratitude. And I'm sure Matt Bradley Shergi will be even happier. <laughs> so, uh, so please go to that. It only takes a minute. And it's well worth it. All right. Uh, what about that news from the Matt Cage? Well, I didn't write this down, but uh, that Dragon, uh, Pathfinder Dragon's Demand, uh, Alan and Luke, you remember a couple episodes back, uh, I believe that's got about four days left to go at the time of this recording. Uh, I think they're about 90%, kind of like Matt Chat. <laughs> you know, they're almost to their uh, threshold for that. Uh, hopefully they'll make it. You know, sometimes at the last minute people come in and kick it up a little bit, but yeah, I'll put another link to the uh, uh, to that Kickstarter page in case you've been holding off or you forgot about it because they're just it's just so close, you know. I really hope they make that, and that will get them over the edge. Okay, let's see. Got a couple of Atari news items here. You remember Atari? It used to be a games company. <laughs> I don't know. Don't know what it is now. You know, I didn't, I didn't get to meet Nolan Bushnell uh, one time. That's probably my claim to fame. Uh, let's see what we got here. Okay, so Atari, the Humble Bundle people, really good group. You can get some fantastic deals. They've got one called 50 Years of Over 100 Play... What is it called? (laughs) It's called Atari Recharged Retro Revival. Okay, and what it includes is over 100 playable video games with Atari 50. 
and 10 classic titles recharged and reimagined for a new generation. Asteroids recharged, breakout recharged, Yars recharged, and more. You get the idea. Uh, so they've taken those classic games, uh, revamped them, added some uh, better graphics and sound and audio visuals so they're a little more playable, probably a little more engaging to your kids or maybe yourself if you want to relive your Atari days. So check that out. And, you know, with the way this Humble Bundle works, if you're not familiar with it, you can uh, pick uh, the level that you want. I think it's maybe $5. Or, it's real cheap to get this collection, but then they uh, donate the profits to uh, charities. So it's, you know, if you want to get it cheap, fine, but you might want to kick in some extra, get some more games, and you help out the charity even more. Uh, so do check that out, Humble Bundle. It's a good group. Uh, it looks like pretty good games, too. And uh, that was, uh, let's see, I think Adam and uh, Alan uh, pitched these news items. So you got that humble bundle you could be playing. And as you're playing, you might want a little something to sip on, right? <laughs> well, you could just sip it from an ordinary decanter set. But you might want this uh, Atari decanter set. This is one that looks kind of cool, doesn't it? That is, uh, I think, $125. Yeah, from the official Atari website. Got the CX40 joystick there as your, I guess, whiskey decanter. Now, I think they missed an opportunity with the glasses on this. Now, I think they should have made the glasses look like those paddles, you know, to kind of go with the theme of Pong. <laughs> uh, but still looks pretty cool. You know, it's probably worth it just for that cool uh, uh, joystick, glass joystick. Looks kind of neat. All right. Uh, moving on, uh, Matt Bradley Shergy sure, wrote in about the Electronic Gaming Monthly Compendium. This is a, a book uh, they're putting out. There's over 320 pages of rich video game history from that magazine. Uh, how many years does it cover? Through the pages. I don't know if I wrote this. Oh, a over a quarter century. So over 25 years of EGM's publications and new insights from the editors. Behind the scenes looks. Behind the scenes look at the magazine's creation, contributions for gaming industry veterans and modern influencers. <laughs> a modern influencer. Am I an influencer? I don't know. Maybe a defluencer. <laughs> Maybe I'm under the influence. I don't know. Uh, add richer context. It's $15 for the digital copy, but come on. You want the hardcover version. I know you. You want the hardcover. That's $50. So not a bad price. They're probably just breaking even on that, if that, uh, given how expensive it is to publish books. So uh, if I were you, I would snap that up. All right. Uh, let's look at the Ale of the Week. Uh, well, uh, somebody was asking me my opinion. You know, I, more and more people are getting into these non-alcoholic brews, but again, it's kind of very random. <laughs> you know, a lot of them are kind of watery tasting, not very pleasant. Uh, there actually is a, last time I did the Surly uh, Axe uh, Sparkling Water, I think they call it Hopped Sparkling Water. <laughs> you know, so that one's just water and hops, sparkling water and hops, and it actually is, is pretty good, you know, believe it or not. Uh, but you probably want something that tastes a little bit more like a, a regular beer. Uh, so I'm going to try this Athletic Brewing Company. This is one of the major brands of these. It's pretty consistently good. You know, it's one of the better ones. Uh, if you're looking for the non-alcohol brew, let's see. It's the Oktoberfest. Does it give me any information? Oh, there's a little bit of info here. In honor of the traditional Oktoberfest, this fest brew is crafted with v Vienna and Munich malts and German noble hops. Now, see, I love this. I think all these beers, you should always list the type of yeast you use, the malts, and the hops. And that way we can learn a little bit about what we like, right? The, the ingredients. This brew has a golden appearance with a clean malt flavor and restrained bitterness. <laughs> Prost. <laughs> Prost. <laughs> Prost. That looks a little bit too much like prostate. <laughs> I don't want to have a check my prostate after this. Prostate. Anything else? Don't see anything. Uh, so let's go ahead and pour it in the glass here first, and then we'll try the drinking horn. You know, the can is kind of plain, just a plain brown can, but I guess that's all right. You know, I like it when they be put a little more creativity into the can. But it's just a can. Also, you get a good, good looking ale on this. Nice head, nice bubbly. Nice bubblies. Well, it's, you know, it's 
I really like to see this. I don't know how well it shows up, but you get the little bitty bubbles, lots of them. Yeah, that's a pretty good sign of good carbonation. It definitely smells a bit hoppy. Smell some of the malts in there. It's got that sort of amber, amber beer uh, aroma to it. Smells good. Pour some on the drinking horn, of course. It is my trademark. And just in case YouTube is listening, this is not an alcoholic. <laughs> you know, I don't know if that even matters. They probably just see a guy with a can and like, it's beer. You know, this is a. Uh, Smells really good. You know, something about the drinking horn kind of concentrates the aroma. It smells good. Let's give it a swig here and see if it uh, tastes as good as it smells. You know, that's got a good, uh, vibrant taste on it. And a lot of pine and citrus in this. Not really very hoppy. It's definitely not bitter. Uh, I'm going to try it again here. Yeah, you mostly taste, I guess, the hops and the malts uh, in this. Again, citrusy, lemony, uh, even maybe even a bit of a lemon rind or lemon zest uh, quality to it. Yeah, it's, it's pretty good. You know, I don't know if all Oktoberfest, I don't know if there's a particular taste they go for. Um, it's definitely not an IPA uh, taste. I guess you would probably, I'd probably call this maybe a golden or an amber. But yeah, you know, it's it's definitely, uh, it's definitely good. <laughs> it's probably not my favorite go-to style. Uh, it's kind of light. I guess you'd probably call this crisp. You get definitely get a good punch of flavor. They're kind of citrusy and piney. That's kind of what I would describe that as. Uh, now, the nice thing about this athletic company is you really can't, at least I can't tell that it's a non-alcoholic uh, brew. So if you just gave me this and said, here, have a beer, <laughs> here, have a Molson. <laughs> I'm not sure I could tell you, oh, yeah, that's a non-alcoholic beer. It doesn't taste watery at all. You know, I, the only, if you really, really were focused, you could probably say, well, it doesn't quite have that same bite, <laughs> you know, the alcohol, but. You know, if you weren't really focused and paying attention, I don't think you'd even notice uh, that it doesn't, or has a low alcohol. I think there's like 0.5 or something. Very low amounts. I guess I can't get, get it completely out. Uh, but it's quite, quite high quality for a non-alcoholic. Yeah. So I have no problem with that one. I'd probably go, uh, just in terms of non-alcoholics, I'd probably go four out of five on this. You know, if you want something, uh, if you like that golden amber style, I don't think you could go wrong with this. You wouldn't even notice it's a non-alcoholic, so you'd definitely be a good choice. Of course, if we compare it to all beers, I mean, there's just no, uh, what can, <laughs> it's not going to hold up all that well. I'd probably give it maybe two out, or three out of five on, on that scale. Uh, but for what it is, and again, in this category, it's, it's a very good example. Well, yeah, quite tasty. I can't quit drinking it. <laughs> so, a good choice. Good job. Athletic, once again. All right, let's wrap it up with a quote. And I found a quote that I liked, and it goes something like this. Games are the most elevated form of investigation. So I like that, but the problem is, who said it? <laughs> so, so the uh, speculation is it was Albert Einstein, where he gets attributed to it. Uh, but they're not certain. They can't find it in any of his uh, writings or anything, so it may not be him. But we do have a quote that is definitely him, and it's kind of related. You, you decide. So here's what he said. Imagination is more important than knowledge. So I think if we put these two together, games are the most elevated form of investigation, and imagination is more important than knowledge, well, that'll give you a little something to ponder. <laughs> So, ponder on that, and I'll see you guys next time.
have any more fun today. I don't think I'm going to be able to take it.